Hi, Chris Kelsall here with AthleticsIllustrated.com. Thank you for tuning into this podcast. You may be familiar with the name Dick Beardsley, who owns a marathon personal best of 209.37, and more famously for his duel in the sun during the 1982 Boston Marathon against the resilient Alberto Salazar. Salazar won. Beardsley came in second in the time of 208. 53. He's quoted as saying after the race, I didn't give an inch, neither did Alberto. In October 2018 for the Good Life Fitness Victoria Marathon, the legendary Beardsley spoke to a crowd of marathon and half marathon runners. Here he shares three short but very funny stories from his running days. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you for bringing me back up here, Rob. Big thanks to, to Benji and Balance Canada for making it possible for my trip up here. And yeah, unfortunately, I, I, I won't be able to be around here for the, the run on Sunday, but I'll be I'll be thinking about you when I'm when I'm back home in the BG and Fort <laughs> Dodge. Uh, but anyhow, thank you. I thought I'd just come up, keep it real lighthearted tonight, and and tell you a couple of just talk about a couple of different stories. Uh, that have to do with with running. So how many of you are running, any of you running your first marathon or half marathon on uh, Sunday? How many of all experience? How many of you are running the marathon or the half marathon on Sunday? Yeah, well, good, 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 good number of you. Yeah, good job. Exactly. And, you know, this time of the of the, of the process and getting ready for your race, you know, it's just two days away, less than that now, and the nerves are always there, and the butterflies, you've been tapering, you feel like a tiger caged up, and, and I remember when I ran my very first grandma's marathon, no, it's not for grandma's, it's just called grandma's marathon, in Duluth, Minnesota, back in 1981, and it was really my first really big race where I was really training especially for that race and I remember it was Thursday morning I went out and did my last little run and I packed my bags and at the time I was living in the Minneapolis St. Paul area that where I was where I was training so I grabbed my bags and I grabbed the mail out of the mailbox and I threw the bags in the back seat threw the mail over on the passenger side and I start driving north to Duluth Minnesota and all I can think about is the race coming up on Saturday. It just consumed my mind. I'm thinking, gosh, Dick, you gotta get your mind off of that. Think about something else. So I happened to look over, and in that pile of mail that was on the passenger seat, one of my uh, running magazines had come, called Track and Field News. I thought, well, I'll just read that while I'm driving to the loop. <laughs> <laughs> so I grab the magazine, and I flip it open, not to any particular page, and this big bold headlines John Graham of England runs 2 hours 9 minutes 45 seconds at the Rotterdam Marathon now this is 1981 back then there was only a few people that have ever run that fast before so I'm reading this article I'm thinking that's un unreal and then I thought boy if I want to get to Duluth in one piece I better put it down so I put it down and I'm driving north on the interstate Again, not trying to think about much. When the first mile marker that I see along the interstate is mile marker number 209. Yeah. Now, I'm always looking for positive things in my life. When I wake up in the morning, I start looking for positive things to enhance my day. So now, all of a sudden, I'm thinking, wait a minute. I flip open to this magazine to not any particular page, and this 209 pops out at me. The first mile marker I see is mile marker number 209. I'm thinking, am I gonna run a 209 marathon on Saturday? <laughs> now my best, I was fortunate, is there a little echo here, Ryan? Yeah, just, yeah. That might help, that might help. And, no, it works. Maybe it's me, this, 
Maybe that needs to be turned down, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so where was I now? Let's see. I'm going. Oh yeah. And so I, I, I see the magazine with 209. I see the mile marker 209. I'm thinking, am I going to run 209 on Saturday? Now my best at that point, I had been fortunate to win the London Marathon. I actually tied with Inga Simonson from Norway. A few months, a couple months before, ran 211.48, so basically 212. What do you think? Well, 212 to 209, that's only three minutes, but three minutes at that end, that's a big jump. So I tried not to think about it, so I pull in to the Radisson Hotel in downtown Duluth at about 2 o'clock that afternoon. I grab my bags, I walk in, I go up to the counter, I said, ma'am, do you have a room? for Dick Beardsley. Oh yeah, you betcha, Mr. Beardsley. And she walks in the back room and she comes out with a packet of information and hands me my keys. She says, good luck on Saturday. I said, yeah, thank you. So I grabbed my bags and I walked around to where the elevators were and the doors were open. So I walked out into the elevator and the door shut. Thankfully, I was the only one on that elevator at that moment. So I set my bags down and I thought, I guess I better see what room I'm in. So I look at my key and I start jumping up and down and screaming and hollering like a little kid that just got a brand new train set at Christmas. What room do you think they had me in? 209! Not even close. <laughs> but it was in room 902. <laughs> and my goofy little mind in the back room, that's 209! <laughs> I didn't tell a soul, not my wife, not the race director, not my coach, but I had no idea if I was going to win that race on Saturday, but I knew I was going to run a 209 marathon. I just knew it. And on that Saturday morning, it was one of those perfect days that every marathoner prays for. It was 48 degrees at the start, 48 degrees at the finish no wind and a little bit of mist and light fog rolling in off that big pond called Lake Superior. And there was a guy in the race named Gary Bjorklund. Now Gary Bjorklund was a Minnesota kid and probably the most talented, one of the most talented distance runners the U.S. has ever had. In high school, in high school, he had the Minnesota State record that he set on a cinder track. He said in 1969, he ran 403 as a high schooler on a cinder track. He was an Olympian. He was a, the defending champion. He ran 210 in the marathon the year before, and he's in the race. His nickname, we always called him BJ. So anyhow, the gun goes off, and off we go. We get about a quarter mile down the road, and it's just BJ and me. And I look behind me. I don't see anybody else because the fog had rolled in and you couldn't see the pack behind us. But BJ turns to me and he says to me, Beards, it's your race, buddy. He says, I'm just here to help you however I can, but it's your race. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. The guy's a defending champion. He's from the Duluth area. He's an Olympian. He's got the course record. My first thought is, he set me up for the kill. <laughs> We're going along, and then about four and a half miles, I get the dreaded stitch. Yeah, that thing that all us runners hate to get. And I'm doing everything I can to get rid of it. But it's only getting worse. So then I'm thinking, golly, BJ said he's here to help me. Do I say anything to him? Finally, it got so bad, I turned around and said, BJ, I said, man, I got a terrible stitch. He said, Beard's no problem. We'll back off the pace a little bit. He says there's an aid station at five mile mark, you'll be fine. So we backed off the pace. Sure enough, I come up to the aid station, take a cup of water, drink it down, bam, the stitch is going. I'm thinking, well, this BJ is a pretty nice guy. <laughs> so we're running along there. Now we're about 10, 11 kilometers into the race, and now I'm running right smack down the middle of this closed highway. I notice he's cutting every corner that he can. Finally, he comes out to where I'm at, and he goes, Beards, what the heck are you doing 
running smack dab down the middle of the road all the time. I go, BJ, what the heck are you doing? I said, you're cheating, you're cutting every corner. And he, he looks at me, his exact words were, you big cob of corn. He goes, <laughs> when they measure a course, yeah. they always measure it, the tangents that you can run. He says, Beards, if you keep running this out in the middle of the road, he says, you're going to run way more than 26.2 miles. So I said, oh, okay, thanks. You know, so I was so naive I was at that point. So we're going along, I'm cutting the tangents now like he is. We hit the halfway point in an hour, four minutes, and like 40 seconds. And he turns to me, he goes, Beards, you got a 209 going. And it started laughing so hard, I thought I was going to have to stop. And I remember asking him, well, can we just stop right now and double our time? Obviously, we'd love to do that, but of course you can't. Well, by about 15 miles, this little chitter chatter we've been having going on for the last hour and some minutes pretty much came to an end. The pace is, you know, we're starting to feel that. And so we're just coming up into the, in, into the city limits of Duluth at about the 18 mile mark where the crowds get real big and everything. And I had a terrible habit back then of looking over my shoulder. No one, probably nobody's back there, but I would do it anyhow. So we're just coming up to about the 18 mile point, and I look over my shoulder to see if anybody's coming. Well, when I turned around, BJ is about 30 yards in front of me, and he is flying. I'm thinking, gosh dang it. He was setting me up. He's waiting until we get into town. The crowd's going to get behind him. And I panicked. So I take off. But I don't catch him until the 19 mile point. I'm thinking, I have got to make him hurt bad. So I threw the hammer down. And I get to the 20 mile mark. And a volunteer on a bike comes up to me and says, Beards, you just ran a 441 mile. But BJ's only 10 yards back. And I look behind me, and sure enough, I can still see the color of his eyes. So I'm thinking, I got to really make him hurt. So I put the hammer down again, and I get to the 21 mile mark, and a bicycler comes up to me and says, Beards, you just ran a 436 mile, and BJ's hurting. I'm thinking, BJ's hurting. <laughs> I think I'm going to have a heart attack at that point, honest to goodness. And I remember looking back, and I could see BJ's head was hanging down, and his, his arms were hanging down, and I thought, okay, I got him hurting, but I'm hurting too, and I better back it off a little bit. So I back off the pace, I come up these two hills at the 22 mile mark, and I start coming down the other side. Now this is in the day before pace vehicles, before they had literally hot air balloons and every mile and you could see this mile mark and you could see the next mile mark already had clocks set up. Back then, you know what they had for mile markers? Honest to goodness, they emptied out one pound cans of coffee, filled it with sand, put a paint stick in there and stapled a piece of notebook paper to it and a magic marker put to it what mile marker you're at. Well, because of the mist and the rain, it wilted those paper markers like a rose in a freezer. So I had no idea where I was. When I look at my little watch I'm wearing, and I'll be darned if the darn battery had <laughs> gone away, and now I have no idea how fast I'm running. So I'm coming down this hill, and I'm coming into the downtown area of Duluth, and now the fog had rolled back in. It was so thick, you could not see a half a block in front of him. And then the dreaded stitch is back. This time it's worse than it was at the five mile mark. This time no BJ there to help me. And I'm doing everything I can. I'm rubbing it. I'm pursing my lips and blowing through them. I'm grunting like a grizzly bear. All these things I've read about to help get rid of stitches and nothing's helping. And I'm thinking, my gosh, the whole field is going to come flying by me if I don't get rid of this thing. But then I knew. I thought, if I can get to that Radisson Hotel where I'm staying, that's right at the 25.2 mile mark. And from there, I make a left-hand turn and I have one mile to go. And I thought, if I can get there and still in the lead, I thought, nobody's going to beat me. But now, 
I was concerned, where is the rat sin? I can't see it because of the fog. So I'm rubbing my side, I'm piercing my eyes, looking for that building, nothing. But I'm still moving one foot in front of the other. Finally, through the fog, I think I see this building. As each step I take, yes, it's getting a little closer and a little closer. Finally, I can actually see the building. I can see the corner where I have to turn left with a mile to go. And I'm getting closer and closer. When I see a little kid playing with his little toy truck in the middle of the street, I'm thinking, surely mom and dad will get the little tyke out of the way here. So I'm getting closer and closer. Now I'm down to about 30 meters from the turn. The little kid's still playing with his truck in the middle of the road. So I start yelling, the kid, the kid, get the kid out of my way. Nothing happens. Now I'm down to 20 meters, now 15. All of a sudden, the little kid reaches down and he picks up his little truck. And he turns and he starts hoofing it across the road. He gets about halfway across when he stops, turns, and his eyes meet mine. And he freezes in place. At this point now, I am less than 10 meters from the corner. I'm thinking, what am I going to do here? If I go to the right, I'm going to run into the oncoming traffic. If I go to my left, I'm going to run into the crowd and that big lamppost on the corner. Or do I take the kid out? <laughs> At that point, my only option was to take the kid out. And at that point, I went smack dab right into him. He went flying up into the crowd. And I looked back, and I heard him crying. And they go, well, that's good. It means he's still breathing. And he's like, oh. <laughs> the best part of the whole deal is when I hit the little guy, it took my stitch away. <laughs> You gotta promise me on Sunday, you get a stitch, you don't pick all those tough little kids off the street. But it worked. And anyhow, I finally I finished. And when I when I crossed that finish line, not only was I fortunate to win that day, but the clock stopped at two hours, nine minutes, and thirty-six seconds. Oh, no. Now, would I have run a 209 that day if I hadn't seen these 209s pop up? More than likely, yes, but here's what it did. And a long, short answer to the story is, anything you can do between now and the time the gun goes off on, one, or on Sunday morning to relax yourself and calm yourself down, that much better you will run. Honest to goodness. You know, because we all get jittery and nervous and stuff, but anything you can do to calm yourself down, it'll help you run that much better. So one last story. You know, I've been running for 47 years now, and I'm slower than molasses in January now, but I go to bed at night, and I can hardly wait to get up in the morning to go for a run. Um, and so many things, yes, you know, running fast, you remember those things, winning a race, whether it be in the open division or age group, yes, you remember those things, but so many things in running, that I remember have absolutely nothing to do with running fast or winning or anything like that. And if you run long enough, you'll get a whole brain full of memories. Well, the, one of them that really stuck out in my mind, years ago, I was invited to a little race in Grantsburg, Wisconsin, called the Setna Mile. Now, Grantsburg is a little town in northwestern Wisconsin of about 1,200 people, and it's 99% Norwegian. So Setna Mai, that's their, their national um, independence day. It's usually about the middle of, of May. They've been trying to get me to come to this race for a few years, and it just never worked. But finally, they called me, invited me to the race. I said, yep, yeah, I'm coming this year. But I said, I won't be getting there till about midnight, because it's a long drive from where I live in northwest Minnesota. He said, not a problem, Dick. I, they said, listen, some of the people that are on the committee, they're going to be gone that weekend. They've already said you can stay in their house. They'll leave a light on in the kitchen for you. They'll leave the side door open. And you can take the first bedroom off the living room. I said, great. So I finally pull into Grantsburg, Wisconsin about midnight. I pull out my little piece of paper. I written the directions down. and I'm, driving down this little street and I'm, nobody's even awake at this point and cars anywhere around and 
when I think, I'm thinking, man, I think I'm getting, got to be getting close. When I look over and I see this little house, and I see the little kitchen light on it, they said we're going to leave above the sink. So I pull into the driveway, and I get out, and I go up to the side door. I'll be doing it. It's unlocked. This is it. So I go back, and I, I grab my bags, and I bring them in the house, and I'm standing in the kitchen, and I can see the living room right out there, and I can see through the darkness the bedroom off the living room. So I walk into the living room there, and I set my bags down. I've been driving for five or six hours. I am dead tired. So I get, I just drop my clothes right then and there, onto the floor, pop naked. And I walk into the bedroom, and I can kind of see the bed, and I'm kind of feeling wrong for the pillow and stuff. And so I, I pull back the main blanket, and then the next spread, and the sheet. And you know when you're really tired, and you first jump into bed, how good it feels, you just get stretched, and you kick your legs off to the side, and your arms, and I slide into the bed, buck naked, I kick my legs off to the side, and I feel a human body. <laughs> and some old lady starts screaming, and then I start screaming. So I jump out of bed, buck naked, I grab my clothes, I run out of her house, jump into my truck, I'm driving down Main Street, Grantsburg, Wisconsin at 12.15 in the morning with a, not a stitch of clothes on. I better get off on a side road, because if I get pulled over, I've got a lot of explaining. So I pull off on a side road, I get my clothes on, thinking, I'll just sleep in my truck. Nobody will know the difference. So I sleep in my truck, I get up the next morning, I put my running stuff on, I thought, well, I'll just run back into town and use it as a warm-up. So I run back into town, and there's all kinds of people around, and I'm thinking, man, they're going to be all excited because I finally was able to make it to their race. Do you think they were talking about Dick Beardsley at their race? <laughs> all the whole talk was, was about some guy that slipped into bed with Gladys Peterson last night. <laughs> so I'm listening to these stories, and I'm thinking, that was me that slipped into bed with Gladys Peterson last night. So I kind of messed up, and I told the guy, that, that was me. And me and Gladys were in bed together. Well, they introduced me to Gladys. She was 86 years old. <laughs> she, she gave me a big hug. <laughs> She got the biggest kick out of telling anybody that would listen that her and Dick Beardsley slept together. <laughs> so, I could go on and on and on about stories not quite like Gladys, but, uh, but the memories that we all get, whether you've been a runner for a year or for 40 or 50 years, keep storing those memories up here in your brain because, you know, There'll be times I'll wake up in the middle of the night and think about Gladys. Well, not in a in a But I can come off quite right there. Uh, but sometimes I will sit and, and, and think about some of those memories. Um, I should tell the Wiener story. The Wiener Dog story. Not the Wiener story. The Wiener Dog story. One last little quick story. Uh, this, is, this is like my favorite. So. We all have our certain little routes that we like to run. So one morning, I'm running this little route. I get outside of town, I'm running down this little country road, and it's just starting to get a little bit light. I mean, you still have to have your headlights on and what? And I run past this little farm, and out from this little gated yard comes this little wiener dog. And he is a yipping and a yapping, and he's biting at my heels, and I'm running along, and I kind of go like this to get him away, and I'm coming up a little rise in the road. I couldn't see the car yet coming towards me, but I could see the headlights coming up over the hill. So as the car got up over the hill, I moved to the side, the car went by, and I hear, bonk. <laughs> I know it, and I'm a dog lover, and I look back. And this wiener dog was like a pancake in the road. I felt so bad. I couldn't even go back. I just kept on running. I couldn't run down that road for the next six months. I felt so bad. Finally, that following spring, I got up one morning. I thought, gosh, you know, I sure miss running down that road. And 
I know that little wiener dogs and wiener dog heaven, so I'm going to run back down that road. So I'm running down this road. I go by the little farm and the little white picket fence and no wiener dog, and I get about 20 meters past the gate when all of a sudden I feel this incredible hot pain in my right calf. And I look out, and there's this wiener dog with his teeth just buried into my, my calf. And I'm going, wiener dog, wiener dog, get off me. And this, this gal comes out of the house, she's going, wiener dog, wiener dog, get off of that guy. And I'm going, bam, as I'm trying to shake this thing off, and he will not let go. I go, didn't that little wiener dog get hit by a car last fall and die? She goes, yeah, he got hit, but we went and scraped him off the, off the, off the uh, pavement, took him to the vet. He survived, he just can't bark anymore. And I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> you keep biting me as long as you want. <laughs> That's one of my favorite stories. Thank you for listening to this humorous podcast speech from the legendary Dick Beardsley. Check out Triple W athleticsillustrated.com and enjoy over 1,000 athlete interviews and profiles.